How, how heavy are you? What is your weight in GV? To remember 27 or 24. What the hell is that? Oh, come on. <laughs> Six. Six. You remember Avogadro's number, right? That's basically the number of protons in a gram, basically. Proton. And a proton is one GeV, basically. Order of magnitude. So one kilo, 10 to the 27 GeV. Easy. That's why you can do it with this. You don't need to do power. You just count the exponential. You can do with this. Or this, this. Or even bigger. <laughs> I mean, when we, uh, when we were young, uh, it was a redshift <laughs> one, but uh, <laughs> there were no calculates to do no. this power. You are not. used to do it with, uh, with boobs. You are not. <laughs> that. With, uh, with, with keepus in the room. OK. So. Um, so I told you yesterday, the main purpose of this course uh, is to investigate what uh, are the principles of particle acceleration. The obvious reason is that we do see non-thermal particles in the universe. And we need to understand how does nature do that. So we know how we do it in a laboratory. Like if you go to LHC, what do you do? You spray a few protons in the uh, loop and uh, uh, accelerator. The magnetic field of the experiment keeps the particles in the loop. But then how do you energize the particles? What do you need in order to energize particles? You need an electric field, because magnetic fields cannot change the energy of the particle, as uh, Pasquale Serpico showed yesterday, right? So you need an electric field. So you have different places in the loop where electric fields is applied, and then the particle keeps gyrating and eventually gets energy through that. We will see, probably today, that in astrophysics, this is not feasible. The first reason why it's not feasible is that you don't have a loop. The second reason is that we will deal uh, throughout this course with plasmas. When I say plasmas, it would be worth to do all different classes on physics of plasmas, but of course we don't have time to do that. But when I say plasma, what I, what, what I will mean is a gas of electrons and protons in charge equilibrium. So there will be roughly the same number of electrons and protons, so that the total charge is zero. The density of these plasmas, as Pasquale Serpico told you yesterday, in astrophysics is always, or almost always, very small. And in these conditions, you can show that the plasma is extremely conductive. It's like a very good metal, OK? That means that uh, uh, whatever electric field you can produce, you can create in your plasma, very shortly, will set in motion electrons and protons so that the electric field is short-circuited. In other words, you cannot have an electric field in a plasma, because if you had, it would be short-circuited immediately. So in astrophysics, it's basically impossible to have electric fields. And yet, we see particle acceleration. So this is the conundrum. How do I accelerate particles and still not being able to have a net electric field? Now, in order to get to discuss these things, I need to go through some steps before that. And I need to understand at least qualitatively. So is any of you that doesn't know what a Vlasov equation is? Raise the hand. So many. OK, so maybe just spend a few, day, a few days, a few uh, minutes, or maybe half an hour or so uh, discussing that. So today we will do basically the content of a, like a year-long course in one hour and a half. So bear with me and uh, please allow me to skip at least some of the steps. You, know, you can find the, step, the, the passages on the notes. Um, and uh, I hope that I can at least convey the main message here. Okay? So the purpose of this lecture will be the following. 
First of all, I want to tell you about an equation which is fundamental both for what I will be discussing and what Pasquale Serpico will be discussing. It is an extremely general equation that describes a very specific kind of particles, particles that don't interact through collisions with each other. Okay? So it, you can apply it equally well to a plasma in the sense that I told you before, or to cosmic rays, or to dark matter, or to whatever else you want, provided you know what kind of forces the particles feel with each other. So in this sense, it is a very powerful uh, equation. Then from that, so this is a very beautiful equation, but unfortunately it's difficult in a sense. It is difficult to apply. So in order to make it a little bit more, uh, a little bit easier to approach, what I will do is to calculate the moments of this equation so that I can have a transition to something that we will call magnetohydrodynamics. Okay, then we will consider an ideal case of this. Ideal, namely, uh, I will make the assumption that I said before, namely that the conductivity is infinite or if you wish that the resistivity of this plasma is uh, close to zero, okay? So I will find the ideal, the equations of ideal MHD, okay? And the fourth step, I'm not sure that we will do this today or tomorrow, we'll take the equations that will derive from there and we'll shake them, <laughs> okay? So the idea in many parts in physics is always to use perturbative theory. So if you know what the system is doing in an unperturbed state, then you can ask yourself, okay, what do I do? Uh, if I have my box and I know what are the laws of physics describing the particles in the box, okay, what would happen if I take the box and I shake it? Like a good example is like this room, okay? You are... Uh, sitting in this room, and there are lots of molecules sitting in this room, of course. And I know what, you know, use the equation of thermodynamics to describe the gas in this room. But then, in this very moment, by talking, I am acting as a perturbation of the uh, air in this room. And if I solve the equations describing the particles in this room, what I would find is sound waves and we'll, we'll actually find sound waves in a second. So perturbing the system, I get modes which are allowed in your system, and we will see that when you have a plasma in the presence of a magnetic field, and I shake the plasma by speaking in a place where there is a magnetic field, I have sound waves, but I also have other modes which are called alphan waves. These alphan waves are extremely important because they are those little wiggles on top of the magnetic field that he drew, uh, drew on the blackboard yesterday. You remember when he uh, 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 outlined the, side, the magnetic field as magnetic field lines, and then he said, well, let's assume that there are wiggles on the magnetic field. Well, those things were actually alphan modes, alphan waves. So we'll see how these things come about, okay? So perturbations. Now, since nobody actually saw this uh, uh, equation before, let me just spend a few uh, minutes talking about it. Okay, so the approach is very simple. Assume that you have just one particle. And of this particle, you know the position. Let's say that the position of this particle as a function of time is some vector xi of t. i denotes the, the, the particle index. And it has a velocity, which is vi, as a function of time. Hmm? Now, let's assume that I know exactly where this position is in, in phase space. When I say phase space, I mean the space made of these two vectors, OK? So the position of this object in phase space will be this guy, no? 
And I know exactly where per that particle is, which means that I can say that the position of this particle in phase space is delta Right? So this doesn't add anything to what I uh, already said. But then if I have many of these particles, then I can define a particle distribution, F, as a function of x, v, and t. This F is the uh, number density of particles per unit volume in phase space a unit volume in phase space, not in physical space, in, the, in space defined by these two variables. And what is this? Again, without adding absolutely anything to what I just said, this is the distribution function that you have, right? Moreover, you can assume, and we have to do that, that you have different kind of particles. And we need to do that because, for instance, in this room, you have protons, electrons, you have molecules, and so on. So in general, you may have different components. So you can say that this is some F uh, of the type of particles of type uh, S, okay? And S for us will be either electrons or ions. Okay, ions, I mean protons, okay? Positive and negative uh, charges. Okay? So far, I didn't add anything to what I, uh, you know, it's just putting in a mathematical form uh, what I said in words. Then, of course, when I have a system, what I want to, uh, what I mean when I say that I describe that system is that I know how it evolves in time, right? So I want to calculate the time derivative. It's too early to yawn because it will get worse. <laughs> so <clears throat> try to be awake and uh, aware of what is going on. So I want to calculate the time derivative of this fs as a function of time. And what do I have? Well, look at this thing. I have to differentiate with respect to time the two variables, xi and vi, right? So I will have a minus x dot, um, sorry, minus sum of uh, one. And, and of course, I'm assuming here that I have a fi <coughs> finite number of particles uh, n. same stuff, okay? So I basically, I, I use the differentiate, I differentiate with respect to this, nabla, the gradient with respect to the x variable, same thing for the vi, okay? Now, the reason why this is useful is because now you see that this object appeared here, which is the acceleration of the particles, right? And I know how to write that if I know what kind of forces are acting on the system, right? So let's assume for a second that it's all non-relativistic, okay? The transition to relativistic is trivial and we will probably not need it at all because as long as you describe astrophysical plasmas, non-relativistic is fine, okay? So this V dot I, what is it? Well, if we had to write the equation of motion of these things, it would be that m times the acceleration is equal to the force, right? Now, if you had to use this equation to describe, or this formalism to describe dark matter, for instance, it's the stereotypical case of a collisionless system, then you would add there the gravitational force. Now, we are interested in plasmas, not necessarily sitting in a gravitational field, okay? 
like uh, the gas in a su around the supernova or around the gamma ray burst, okay? That's what we're talking about. So the acceleration here, and this is very important to understand, will be only due to the electric fields and magnetic fields that the particles themselves are generating, okay? So in writing this equation, the only electric field and magnetic fields that will appear and the force corresponding to them is the electric field and magnetic field produced on the individual particle but all the others. So you realize how powerful this would be if we could get this equation because it's the evolution of an equation under the action of its own electromagnetic fields. That's what a plasma is. You know, when a supernova explodes in a medium, <clears throat> it's actually expanding in a plasma which satisfies this type of equation. So what do I have here? That M, M here is the mass of the particle that I'm interested in. So uh, depending on whether it is an electron or an ion, it will be some MS. Okay? So what is this? Well, this will be the, car the charge times the electric field. Let me call it uh, E um, M of X and T plus, in the presence of a magnetic field, how would you write the force here? Okay, where this EM and BM, M stands for microscopic, so what I mean is that this is the electric field and magnetic field on the particle of type I, produced by all the other particles in the system. How do I do that? Well, I have to find an additional equation, of course, that describes the electric field and magnetic field. Unfortunately, we have them. It's the Maxwell equations, right? So what I can say is that uh, the divergence of the electric field is 4 pi, the density of charges, right? And let's put here the uh, index M, again, to indicate that we're talking about the microscopic ones. And also, of course, divergence of B is zero, fortunately. So magnetic field lines close. Uh, but then I have source terms, right? So who is actually producing uh, the electric field and magnetic field? Well, I know that the curl of magnetic field is one minus uh, one over C dB in dt, and the curl of B m is four pi over C j m of x and t plus one over C d in dt. Okay. Okay, so the crucial point here is, however, you see that the source terms are this zeta, the charge, and this J, the current. Huh? But that's where the magic happens, because this current, uh, this, I'm um, sorry, charge, is now the sum over the type of uh, particles, so ions or electrons, with their own charge, QS, integrated and in the same way J the current is the sum Okay? Now, notice what happened. All of a sudden, the dynamics of the particle of type I is becoming sensitive to the charge and the uh, current produced by all the other particles of all the types. Okay? So when I'm summing over the type of particle and I'm integrating over the whole phase space, I'm actually taking into account the effect of all the other particles that I have.
And these are source terms. So the electric field and magnetic field is being actually produced by all the other particles in your plasma. So the problem, per se, is getting uh, closed, in a sense, right? I mean, I have uh, uh, everything well defined. Now, let's go back uh, to this guy here, OK? Let's go back to this guy. And where should I write? Um, maybe down there. OK, so. So this DFS in uh, uh, DFS in DT is equal to, well, x dot i, because of the delta function here, no, I can pull it out and call it v, and this is the gradient with respect to the x variable, right? So I can write this as a minus v dot nabla x dot the sum of the delta function. Let me write it in a, this way coincisely, but what I mean is the whole thing here, okay? This product. <clears throat> and then the second term, minus QS uh, over MS, because I have to use this one, no? Q divided by MS for V dot I. put it here, ms, and then I have um, Okay, this is the force dot nabla with respect to the velocity of the two deltas. Okay? But then you realize immediately that uh, this guy here, I can use the properties of the delta function to pull this guy out and to call uh, and, and to identify this object here as the function f that I'm talking about, right? So in the end, you know, if I go smoothly from here, this transforms into dfs in dt plus v dot nabla x of fs plus qs over ms uh, em plus 1 over c v vector b m dot nabla v uh, fs, OK, equal 0. Now, in principle, I could stop here. For historical reasons, this is no, not only historical, but I'll tell you in a second. So this is called the klimantovich dupre equation. Now, the reason why I cannot stop here is because these electric fields and magnetic fields with the M on a paddock, on an up uh, index, are microscopic fields. So they are objects which are fluctuating like crazy, right? Because it can happen that a particle is particularly nearby or far away. There are over densities, under densities. So this EM and uh, BM are in general a mess. And I, I wouldn't even know how to use this equation because I don't know the actual motion of the individual particles, right? So what people do is to say, OK, you know what? I'm not, I'm not even interested in knowing the motion of a single particle. What I care about is describing the statistical properties of this object. So what I want to do is to uh, integrate on little volumes in which I have enough particles so that this n is large, but not that large that I'm averaging over directly over the whole system. 
So enough, large enough to make statistical um, samples, which are meaningful, but also small enough that I retain all the properties of a plasma. For instance, one of the properties of a plasma, which unfortunately we don't have time to go through, is that it self -sheed, shields. So in other words, if you have a plasma and you take a charge and you throw it in the plasma, okay, so you are adding one charge, automatically the other, other charges rearrange themselves in such a way that if you are farther away from that charge than a critical distance called the Debye length, you don't even know that that particle is there. Okay, so it's a sort of a censorship. If you throw one more charge in the plasma, the plasma creates the conditions for that, for that additional charge to be hidden. Okay, so if you are more distant than the Debye length, you don't even know that you added a charge. So I want to retain that kind of phenomenology, but still try to average out all the small scale fluctuations. And that's what, uh, that's a gener generic technique that's usually very useful. In other words, what I want to do is to, from the mathematical form, to say that I want to uh, consider this Fs as some average value plus some fluctuations of it, okay? These are the fluctuations associated with the small scales. And I want to do the same thing for the magnetic fields. So from BM or EM, I want to actually go into some average fields, E and B, plus fluctuations of, of it, okay? And what I want to do is to take these things and go in, uh, put them in here and see what happens. Okay, this is a simple exercise, and what I want to, uh, what I want you to do, it's, it's really a simple thing, it's just putting this in there, okay? And assuming that this equation is true, okay? So whenever you, so when you put this stuff in here, of course you will have all the terms which contain, um, which contain uh, BM and EM, okay? Which will give some equal to zero. So those terms will go away, and you will be left only with the quantities that describe Fs as a function of mean E and mean B, okay? And in principle, you can put more terms here, but we will retain only up to the second order, okay? So again, this is really a trivial exercise, just replacing this into this thing and see what happens. But what happens is uh, very interesting because the final equation that you get is this. Notice that now all these E, B, F, and so on, they are all the mean values. Um, equal, okay, on the other side, you will be left with minus Qs over Ms times the mean value of delta E plus 1 over Cb vector delta B Okay, so you see that this object is the, a, a product of two perturbations, okay? So you expect, just by looking at it, that this object is small compared with the terms on the left side, which are the mean values, right? So you see this is all products of delta E, delta Fs, or delta B, delta Fs. So they are a higher order. Or if you wish, look at it in another way. If you have a system of uh, n particles, the fluctuation, even just Poisson fluctuations, on top of those are of order <laughs> If you have a system of n particles, the fluctuations are of order square root of n, right? So this object here is actually uh, proportional I'm sorry, this is uh, dot nabla f, OK? 
okay? Sorry. This object is order n, and these are the fields produced by the same particle, so those are also order n. So this is n squared. But here, this object here, this is of order square root of n, this is square root of n, so it's of order n. So this object is subdominant compared to this. What is this term? Well, this term is what describes in a plasma a strange concept of collisionless collisions. Uh, in other words, it's, the, it's what happens to the particle under the effect of fluctuations on small scales due to the particles nearby, okay? But we are interested only in what happens not on those small scales, but on very large scales. So this object here will uh, neglect, okay? So we'll say that this term for us is negligible, and we will say that this is zero. So this left hand is equal to zero. This is the Vlasov equation. And describes the system, the evolution of the system under the action of the electric and magnetic fields produced by the, the same particles on scales which are uh, large enough. Now, there is an easy interpretation of this, right? Because we have defined the sp phase space, Ri, as Xi Vi, right? So if you think about it, this object here, this equation here, what is it? It's DFS in dt plus the time derivative with respect uh, to the first variable, which is x, plus the time derivative with respect to the second variable, which is vi. So if you define the total time derivative with respect to uh, the variable ri, okay, what you're saying is that this object is zero. So basically, what you're saying is that you are describing conservation of number of particles in phase space. So this is called the Liouville theorem. So Liouville theorem and the Vlasov equation are basically the same thing once you remember uh, what we are talking about, namely that the, for the particles are not free here. They are, uh, uh, there is a force exerted on them by all the others, okay? Okay. And then basically you will get you will the question in terms of this single particle correlation function, right? But the, the physical part is when you neglect this term. Exactly, exactly. So it's neglecting this term that is throwing away uh, a lot of information which is not observationally accessible anyway. So it, it's stuff that you're giving up, but you wouldn't be able to measure it anyway. Okay? This basically class of this like the usable form of the UV equation, something. That's fine, that's right. So now Let's uh, just to make uh, the physics always clear. The mathematics is nice, but in the end, we are physicists. So what are we doing here? We have two species. S is equal to ions or electrons, right? And for each one, please be careful about what I'm saying. For each one, we have an equation. This is an equation that for Fs. So you can write one equation for the protons and one uh, for the electrons. But E and B are the same for both. So the coupling between the two components of the ions and the electrons are the electric fields and magnetic fields which are produced by all the others. So they are not two independent Vlasov equations because they are coupled through the electromagnetic uh, fields which uh, are produced by all the other particles. This is something very important to keep in mind, okay? And the electric fields and magnetic fields are again described by these expressions here. Only here I don't have M anymore, 
And here I don't have FS, but capital FS. OK? So if I want to summarize here, each species in the plasma is defined by a Vlasov equation. And the E and B satisfy Maxwell equation. with source terms psi, uh, zeta, And J. <coughs> okay. OK? So if I know, so you see that the f that I'm trying to solve actually enters in the source terms that give me E and B. OK? So the system, in a sense, is closed. How easy it is to solve it, it's a different business. But I have an equation that describes for me what is going on. Now. Notice, please, the power of this result. It's not a trivial conclusion. You can apply this to whatever comes in your mind arbitrarily complicated. For instance, you may have a plasma of electrons and protons, right? But in the end, we are interested in putting cosmic rays in this business. What happens to cosmic rays? Well, they are charged, so they feel electromagnetic fields. And uh, they are collisionless. Certainly, they don't interact much with themselves, right? So I can write another equation, Vlasov equation. So I can write one for protons. Then I can write one for electrons. And then I can write one for cosmic rays. But when I add the cosmic rays, you see that they also contribute to the charge and the current, provided I make sure that the source terms, zeta and j, take into account all the components, these equations describe whatever system you want. If I, I can put helium, I can put whatever I want, provided I know positrons, provided I know how to connect the source terms with the electromagnetic fields, this equa these set of equations give me the full story. Not only that, it's more powerful than that, in fact. Now, assume that I have these equations, and I, I write them down. For, let's keep it simple. Let's just do it, electrons and protons, right? So I have only electrons and protons, a normal plasma. And they are described by uh, those equations there. Now I can ask yourself, I can ask myself, what happens if I perturb the system? So I assume that I know the equilibrium situation. And I assume that the equilibrium situation is perfectly well determined. And uh, for instance, I, I can assume that, um, um, let me assume, for instance, that there is no net electric field, which will be a good assumption because of what I will be discussing in half an hour. So let's assume that there is no macroscopic electric field. I'm not saying that there are no microscopic, microscopic electric field. I'm saying that there is no field on large scales, but there is a magnetic field. Let's also assume that the system is all homogeneous, OK? So at the zero order, OK? So I know exactly what is the so-called equilibrium solution of this equation. There is no ambiguity in that. Therefore, I can 
I ask myself, what happens if I perturb the system? So I know what this fs uh, at the zero order is, okay? So let's, let me call the zero order with the index zero, okay? So I can write fs as fs zero plus some delta fs. And I can do the same for the magnetic field which is B0 plus delta B. And I'm saying there are no net electric fields, which doesn't mean that there are no perturbations. So I can have delta B. So he is delta B, uh, delta E, sorry. Okay? So I can take this, uh, the, the solu the, this equation at the zero order and shake it. Okay? And... This is the same thing that you would do, for instance, to find the uh, equation of motion of electromagnetic waves, or if you, the dispersion relation, sorry, of electromagnetic waves, or the dispersion relation of sound waves, or any kind of perturbation in your system, right? Uh, notice that you need to know the equilibrium solution, Fs0. You can make an assumption, like you say, okay, you know, I'm, I know that my plasma is thermalized, and even more, I assume that for simplicity, it has zero temperature, okay? That means that the F0 is a delta function at P equals zero, for instance, momentum P equals zero, okay? So when you shake this system, what, you, what I mean by shaking this system is that you take these things here. We will not do this exercise, otherwise it will take two hours for no reason because it's a simple exercise, but it's just very long. But you take these things uh, and you put them here. I'm just telling you because some of you in the future might find this exercise useful. Um, you take these things and you put them in the original equation. And what you get is a, let me erase here. some function f of k, k and omega equals zero. What are k and omega? Well, it's a, a game that is always played in this case. Once you write the perturbation in this form, you can decompose the perturbation in its Fourier modes. So you can always write all the perturbations in the form, for instance, delta b as uh, delta b in modulus times exponential of minus i omega t plus i k dot x. And you do the same for all the perturbations, okay? And when you put this in here, you see it's very simple. Because, for instance, what would happen when you do um, just an example, okay? D in dt of a perturbation. Well, fs looks the same, no? It has a perturbation in the form of uh, minus i omega t plus i k dot x. But then when you do the time derivative, what happens is that you pull down the minus i omega from there, right? So you have minus i omega, and the rest is the perturbation again, right? So all the terms in the form of d in dt transform themselves into minus i omega delta f. All the terms that have the space derivative, like v dot nabla, becomes v dot k delta f. Okay? And it's really an easy game to play. Uh, you just take the exponential the perturbation in the form of uh, waves, and you replace this in this equation here. And all the terms... Um, all the terms uh, with derivatives are transformed in this way. And in the end, after a couple of uh, dozens of pages of arithmetics, uh, well, not exact arithmetic, but something like that, you get an equation of this form, f of k omega equals zero. What is that? That's a dispersion relation. So in other words, it's telling you what are the modes, what are the type of oscillations of the system that are allowed, okay? 
I, I don't think this is very important for you to remember. Okay, I'm just telling you because this is, uh, we'll get to, it, to the same conclusions through some shortcut. But I'm, I think it's useful for you to know that there are uh, these things. And just for you to have an idea of what I'm talking about, I mean, how bad, how bad is the, the, this f of k and omega? This f of k and omega is uh, in this form here. This is the function f of k and omega that I'm talking about. It looks awful, but it's really not. Uh, I'm sorry, this was capital F. OK. It looks awful, but it's really simple. For instance, if you assume that the particles are cold, then it means that uh, these terms uh, uh, would, as a function of momentum, become so much simpler, because they are just delta function in momentum. Also. Uh, if you're dealing with a plasma, normal plasma, then it's isotropic. So you have the same number of particles moving in any angle mu. So this df in d mu is zero. So the situation becomes much easier once you start dealing with it. This is the most general thing that you can have. But the interesting thing is that if you solve this problem, namely cold gas uh, plasma in a magnetic field B0 which is oriented around the z direction, as uh, Professor Serpico showed yet, uh, uh, discussed yesterday. This equation here reduces to omega equal k v a, with v a equal to b zero over square root of four pi rho, where rho is the density of the gas. We will get to this point in the next hour in a completely different and simpler way. But it's useful to know that you can get to the same end point in different ways. So this is the dispersion relation of the perturbations that are allowed in a plasma made of electrons and protons in the presence of a magnetic field. What is this saying? That the only waves that are allowed are the ones whose frequency is related to the wave number through a velocity which is not, as it would be for electromagnetic waves, the speed of light, but the different speed. It's called the Alfven speed, and depends on the magnetic field as linear in the field and as one of the square root of the density of the gas. Okay? Again, this is something that I'm telling you because of uh, many reasons. You will understand it through the course. One last thing that I want to say as you see, this equation is non-relativistic, right? That's because we sort of said we want to describe a general plasma like at the temperature of 10 to 4, 10 to 5, which is the Kelvin, which is the typical temperature of the interstellar medium. For intergalactic medium, it might say be 10 to 5, 10 to 6 Kelvin, but it's still way below the temperature, the mass of the proton, right? So it would still be non-relativistic. But I also told you that this equation, in principle, could describe the behavior of uh, a, a bunch of cosmic ray particles, right? Exactly the same, with the one exception that I, would, I have to make it relativistic. This is trivial. So you can do exactly the same thing. The only thing that changes is that here, this is not v dot, but p dot, the momentum. So in the, non in the relativistic, I have here p dot, and no ms, of course. Huh? And the phase space is not xv, but xp. 
That's the only thing that changes. So you redo exactly the same thing, you get in a trivial way the same result with one exception. So let me write down here the relativistic version of it. So relativistic. of x, p, and t, plus v dot nabla. This v comes from the derivative of the x, so it stays the same with respect to x of fs plus qs over, uh, I'm sorry, this was no c here, this qs, qs times e plus 1 over c v vector b hmm? times the gradient with respect to p of fs equals 0. OK? This is the relativistic generalization of the Velocity equation. And it's perfectly OK to use this for describing cosmic rays. Now, yeah. Are we in the rest frame of the final of the We're not because this V is the velocity of uh, the particles in the plasma or the velocity of the particles in the, of the cosmic rays. The decision of uh, uh, in which frame you are shows here in dependence on, of the distribution function on P and mu. So for instance, if you are already assuming to be in the system in which the plasma is at rest, it's, in a, in, uh, it's isotropic in its own frame, so the f in the mu is zero, but maybe the cosmic rays in that frame are not isotropic, right? So in that case, when you describe this term for the cosmic rays, you will have to take it, this into account, okay? You can apply this to any frame you want. It's just that you have to decide what's the distribution function. Again, I'm not saying this, all of this, because you have to remember, but just because 10 years down the road, you might think, oh, that guy, I think he said something about that. So let me look back at the notes, assuming that you still have the notes. The second reason why I'm telling you this, because uh, there is something very interesting that happens when you solve the exercise I just said. So if you have protons, electrons, and then you pour in just a bunch of cosmic rays, very small number. In the interstellar medium, any of you know what's the density of uh, cosmic rays in number? Number density of cosmic rays in the galaxy compared with the interstellar medium. Interstellar medium is uh, one particle per cubic centimeter, right? Cosmic rays? Let's start from the pressure or the energy density. What's the energy density of the interstellar medium? I think Pasquale Serpico said it yesterday. Hmm? 10 to the minus 6 what? No. That would be a gigantic. Oh, energy density. Energy. Or de number density we said is one particle per cubic centimeter, right? So in energy density, say take a gas of temperature 10 to 4 Kelvin, density 1, you get roughly order fraction of electron volts per cubic centimeter. Okay? No, 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 no. I'm talking about electrons and protons in the ISM. Normal gas. It's one electron volts per cubic centimeter. Order of magnitude. Thermal energy. And then he told you yesterday that the energy density in the form of radiation and magnetic field is roughly of the same order of magnitude. And also the energy density in the form of cosmic rays is roughly there. So one electron volts per cubic centimeter, right? Huh? OK. So but then you can ask, what is the density a number? And the typical energy of the particle is 10 to 9 uh, electron volt, one, one GV, so it's 10 to 9 electron volts. But that means that the number density is about 10 to minus 9. So for one particle per cubic centimeter in the form of gas, 10 to minus 9 particles per cubic centimeter in the form of cosmic rays. So from the point of view of density, they are totally irrelevant. Hmm? 
So now you take a particle, a, a proton, electrons in the interstellar medium, and then 10 to minus 9, tiny little insignificant fraction of cosmic rays, and you do exactly the same game. No? And something magic happens. <laughs> It's not magic, we'll understand it why in a second, but it looks really fantastic. When you solve this, exactly the same exercise, exactly the same, you go to the, to the end of the situation, and you get that omega is equal to kVA plus a little term, and that little term makes omega becoming imaginary. Okay, but look at what happens. If omega is imaginary, Depending on the sign, this wave describes either something that is uh, dying, is damped, or something that explodes. And it turns out that uh, the addition of cosmic rays makes the wave explode. So in other words, if you add this minuscule, insignificant, stupid term, 10 minus 9, with the right conditions, you have Alvan waves that uh, instead of propagating as waves, start bouncing out and become exploding uh, in terms of magnitude. And that is an a crucial ingredient in the acceleration of cosmic rays because, uh, you, as we will see, we need this phenomenon for particle acceleration. But we will get to the same conclusion going around the problem, so we'll make a simpler uh, uh, derivation of this result without going through the calculations, okay? Um, I have another half hour, right? Huh? Yes. Okay, so let's make another mile here. I say half an hour. <laughs> I have a question. You see? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Omega S here, the capital Omega S is what Pasquale Serpico uh, showed yesterday. It's the cyclotron frequency of the particle of type S. So if S is ion, it's the cyclotron frequency of uh, uh, the ions. If S is E, the electron, it's the cyclotron frequency of the electrons. So it's uh, just a refresh here. So Omega S is E, B0, well, Q, S B zero over M S C. Hmm? Ah, okay. I have another thirty something <laughs> pages, so okay, let's see where we can get. You know, we can get where we can get. The important thing is that it's useful. I hope. Um, okay, so let's erase here. Can I? Here I will try to go a little bit faster uh, in the sense of skipping some um, al algebra. Otherwise, we don't get to the bottom line. OK, so at this point, we already made a milestone of deriving the Vlasov. And uh, I told you what happens when you take this Vlasov and you perturb it. But again, even the Vlasov itself, although beautiful formally, but from the point of view of actually doing calculations, it's really troublesome because you have to know all these details about uh, the different components, electrons, protons. So let's try to make it simpler, okay? So I want to go <laughs> from one to two. <clears throat> so I want to derive some average quantities from the Vlasov, yeah. So you say that this equation describes a positionless plasma. Mm -hmm. Temperature doesn't, define, doesn't depend on whether there are collisions or not. If you have a bunch of uh, balls in a box you can describe, and, and they don't collide with each other, you can still, still describe a temperature as the random motion of the particles. You don't need them to interact with themselves. You can define the temperature of dark matter, and still they don't interact with, them, with themselves, right? So it's just a measurement of the uh, amount of random motion uh, of the particles in the, plas in the plasma. It's a little abuse, right? They are not in equilibrium with a reservoir or any sort. Just uh, yeah. 
temperature is just like, yeah, it's just a kinetic quantity. It doesn't mean that it's in equilibrium with anything. Okay, so uh, again, I want to restart from this, uh, this equation here. And again, you can, uh, I want to sit in a simple situation in which I only have protons and, uh, and the electrons. And also, let me write this because it's useful for what I'm going to do uh, in terms of the components, okay? So this, uh, let me use the symbol small f, otherwise I keep making a mistake of calling it small f anyway, so let's go directly there. dfs in dt plus. So this object here, we can write it as the r component of uh, the velocity, it's time dfs in dxr, and uh, index r is repeated here, which means it's summed up, okay? Okay, so here I have Q, um, one over C, Okay, where epsilon, you know what it is, right? It's a Levi-Civita tensor. So it's a completely anti-symmetric tensor. Every time that you exchange two indexes, it goes to zero. Every time that two of the indexes are the same, it's zero. So it looks complicated, but in the reality, it's supposed to make your life easy. Okay, so I have this equation here. Now, let me define a generic function of x, v, and t. Generic, whatever it is, whenever you want to. Uh, I'm sorry, x and t. And I want to calculate the mean values, uh, the mean value of this uh, psi on the uh, function f. So what, what would I do? If I want to calculate the average of, on the f, I would define an object which is the integral in d3v of this phi, it is v, or this psi of uh, x, v, and t times f. But then I have to normalize to what? Well, you divide by the same quantity without the phi, no? So this is the mean value of that psi. But this quantity here, what is it? Hmm? The integral in D3V of the distribution function density. is the density, right? So this thing here is simply 1 over the density times the integral in D3V of psi f. Okay, so uh, okay, so for simplicity, let's start by taking a psi, which is only a function of the velocity b. Okay, so let's say that psi is arbitrary, but it's only a function of b. And let's see what happens if I take this psi, I multiply all the terms in the velocity equation by that psi and I integrate it over the D3V, okay? So, for instance, the first term here it will be the integral in D3V of this uh, psi of V times DF in DT, but this is D in DT of the integral in D3V of psi F, no? But you see this is exactly n times the mean value of the psi that we defined before. So this is simply d in dt of n mean value of psi. So this first term would give me something like that. And psi, again, is completely arbitrary so far. Then, for instance, the second term. Let's see what would happen there. 
So I, I would have the integral in D3V uh, of uh, psi, and then I have VR df as in dxr, right? But again, psi is only a function of uh, the velocity. So I can pull out the d in dxr, and I get the integral in d3v of psi vr f. But again, that remember the definition of uh, mean value of psi. This is d in dxr xr of n mean value of psi vr. No? And I can do the same thing on the third term. It's the same story. OK? So in general, let me erase here. So in general, the equation I get for an arbitrary choice of uh, psi is this guy here. Epsilon RSTBT mean value of d psi in dvr times Vs. So this thing here is this first term. This comes from the second term. And the other two comes from the ER and Epsilon RS. OK? At this point, since psi is completely general, I can do whatever I want with that, right? And so, for instance, um, I can take psi equal 1, just a number. No? Psi equal 1. And then I have dn in dt plus d in dxr of n vr, let's uh, call mean value of vr, let's say that it's some um, ur. And then this term is 0, this term is 0. You know what this is? It's, huh? But for what? It's the conservation of mass. It's saying that the density in a box, number density, changes in time only because there is a flux, and you are, that goes through the wall of the box. And the flux through the wall is the divergence of the flux. So the density in that box remains constant unless there is particles coming in or out of that box. Okay? And UR here is the mean value of the VR. Now, this is simply a conservation of mass, but notice here at some point doing the calculation, I sort of uh, ignored the fact that I'm doing this for <clears throat> each velocity equation, right? So I said there is one for ions and there is one for electrons. So in principle here, I get one equation for conservation of mass for each one of the species. OK? We'll see later what happens. Well, at this point, you learned the game, right? I, it's not useful, useful to go through all the details, because it's just arithmetics. But I got this equation, which is general. And now, and now just choose whatever you want for psi. We did the exercise for psi equal 1. Now, what is the next? obvious choice, psi equal to vr or vs, something, no? one of the components of the velocity. And the next choice, well, v squared. 
And then if you want, you can do V cube or V square VR. You can enjoy yourself and you know, if you have nothing better to do, which I think you don't, <laughs> uh, you do. <laughs> so anyway, so for psi equal one, you get conservation of mass. For psi equal VR, so this is for psi equal one. This afternoon or whatever your time, you can try to redo exactly the same thing, but for, for psi equal VR. And I'll give you directly the end result, otherwise we don't go anywhere. Um, so it's D in D T of rho U R plus D in D X uh, S rho V R Vs minus Q and ER minus Q and over C epsilon RST VT US equals zero. And we will see later that this is uh, actually a strange form of the equation of conservation of momentum. So conservation of mass. and momentum. And then you can do the same thing, but uh, so this was for psi equal VR, VR. Now third choice, psi equal one half of V square. Again, you redo the old shebang and uh, at the end of the story, Maybe you will get, where the heck is it? <laughs> Just one second. Ah, oh, shoot, sorry. So I exchanged the two equations. This is, of course, the conservation is not. This is uh, psi equal to one half V squared. And the other one is uh, D in DT of um, okay. I guess I'm not the only you are the only not the only one that is tired. I was right. So this one is fine. This is psi equal VR, and for psi one half of V squared, you have D in DT of one half. Rho V squared average plus D in the XR of uh, one half rho V square VZ minus N Q ER UR equals zero. This is for psi equal one half of V squared. Again, it's, don't be scared by the appearance of this. It's, uh, it's all relatively trivial to do once you just uh, insert the quantities. It's algebra. Now, the step that is missing at this point is that, in reality, I have no freaking idea what the electrons and protons are doing in a plasma. So I only care what average quantities, like the density, the temperature, the pressure, these are the things that I measure. And that's where I want to go. Okay, so I don't care about what the individual components um, are doing. So this fortunately makes our life a lot simpler, provided I define quantities in the right way, in the smart way. Okay, so for instance, what is the density of the plasma? Well, it is the density of the ions you know, times the mass of the ions plus the density of the electrons times the mass of the electrons. You know? That's what I can measure. It's the density of the, uh, the total density of the gas. At the same time, the, car, the charge in my system, the charge density is the density of the ions minus the density of the electrons times the charge, no? Moreover, uh, 
we define there those UR, but in reality, I should say a UR of the ions and a UR of the electrons. So this is the mean value of the VR of the ions. And I have similar thing for the electrons. No? And then, very important, I can define fluctuations on top of them. So for instance, for the ions, I can define this as V uh, I R minus U I R. Why won't I do that? And the same thing for the electrons. Well, because the fluctuations are the ones that are going to correspond to the temperature, right, of the, of the plasma, or if you wish, uh, the ones that would correspond to the pressures. So once I make these, um, uh, I introduce these quantities, I can also define the pressures. And again, the pressures are, the pressure tensors are easy to define because it's for the ions, for instance, Mi times the integral in D3V times the distribution function of the ions and W uh, I R W I S. And the same thing for the electrons. Okay, same thing. Okay, so that helps because at this point what I have is Let's make a simple example. Let's take this one, conservation of mass. Okay? I told you, you have two of these equations, four for the ions, one for, uh, for the electrons, right? But what happens when you sum them together? Well, look at it. Here you will have n ions. Multiply both of them by the mass of the ions. No? This is d rho ions or d rho electrons. But when you sum them together, you will get exactly this quantity here. And so when you sum together the two equations for the conservation of mass for the individual components, you will actually get conservation of mass. And at this point, you don't care anymore. You're not talking about electrons and ions anymore. You're just talking about the density of the plasma. That's what you call the density of the plasma. OK? And now you can do exactly the same thing for all the other. So for instance, you can write this one for the ions and this one for the protons. You sum them together. OK? And you do exactly the same thing. You go through the algebra again. And in the end of the day, you get rho um, u plus u dot nabla uh, uh, ur u, sorry, equal minus nabla pressure plus one over c j vector B. So these two are respectively conservation of mass and conservation of momentum for a plasma. Notice here, there is no memory left of electrons and ions. This P is the pressure of the overall plasma. It already knows What's the balance, electrons and protons? It's written already here. OK? You don't need to know anything else. Now, in reality, there is another term here, plus zeta e, which I didn't write explicitly, because usually we will not put that term. Namely, we will assume that the plasma is in full equilibrium in charge. So zeta, the net charge, is zero. So the net electrons plus protons, they balance each other exactly, OK? So usually this term is not there. So these are the two equations, which are the basics of uh, what we call magnetohydrodynamics. Here, we have lost all the information whatsoever about electrons and protons. Now we have just a blob of stuff density rho, pressure P, nothing else, OK? And notice that what he's saying. Well, this guy here is the time derivative 
of the density, right? So the density and the velocity, sorry, rho times uh, 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 acceleration, okay? It's the equation of motion. So the equation of motion of the plasma, it's such that it must equate a force. No, the momentum of the, of the particles in the plasma changes because there is a force. What is the force here? Well, this is obvious. It's the force associated with the magnetic field. No? It's the J vector B. That's exactly like the analogous. That one is the, the child of this term. It came out of there. This is also trivial. If you, if you had possibly an electric field, this would be the electric force. This one? This is extremely important. A gradient in the force is always, as a gradient in the pressure is always a force, okay? So if we try to push this wall on this side and this side, you're exerting a pressure, it would be zero if there is no gradient in the pressure, but if there is more pressure in this, on this side than on this one, so you have a pressure gradient, then there is a net force in that direction. So if you have a gradient in the pressure, then the plasma is starting to move, and that's the essential, uh, one essential ingredient. No, no, uh, yeah, a time derivative, you mean. A time derivative. So this is uh, d rho, this is uh, rho du in dt where D, the capital D, is the total time derivative, okay? So this is rho times du in dt plus u dot nabla u, okay? Okay, so I don't think we can go uh, beyond this point today. So we derived the equations of, uh, the basic equation of magnetic hydrodynamics it is not the end of the story. It can, it can be made simpler than this by making the assumption of ideal magnetohydrodynamics. So what we will do next time, tomorrow, is to assume that the conductivity of this plasma is infinite. And this equation will be even simplified a lot more. And at that point, we are ready to play some interesting games. Sorry that this part is, uh, is important if you want to understand some of the things that will be discussed both by me and by Pasquale Serpico. So it was needed the suffering of going through a little bit of math. Uh, but um, I hope it's of some use, at least. Okay, questions? No, you ask questions. It is not even on breakfast, so this is really hard work. Questions? I know you said you're going to explain this in a different way, but um, you mentioned that when we add cosmic rays into the equation, we get an uh, uh, exploding exponential term. But that's in our fluctuation. So doesn't that mean that we can't do perturbation anymore? That's very good observation. That's exactly the point. So uh, yes, so it means that uh, you uh, start from a perturbation theory and you may easily fall out of it, which is a sign that you need a nonlinear theory. And that's exactly what's gonna happen. Uh, however, sometimes the perturbative theory that you're using may be um, a good approximation even in the nonlinear theory for reasons which are, uh, okay, so for instance, let, let me give you an instance. Um, Let's assume that as a consequence of uh, this mechanism, you have a field which is blowing. Okay, so it's getting larger. And we're interested in knowing what happens to the cosmic rays, no? Now, Pascal Serpico yesterday made a beautiful drawing here, which he showed that if you have a field like this and the Larmor radius is like this, then the particle is averaging out over these perturbations and they uh, the particle ignores those perturbations, no? 
if the particle, if the gyration is like this and the wave is like this, again, it's going to ignore it because it looks like a, a tilted local magnetic field line, but nothing dramatic is going to happen. The dramatic thing happens when the two are comparable. Now, you may have, as a result of some, and we will talk about one of them, you may have that the delta B is growing, but it's growing in this way. So in fact, even in this situation, the average field felt by the particle during one gyration is basically uh, the original field, because the small scales are, fly, are, are averaged away. So you may be able to keep using the perturbative theory, because the delta B is getting bigger and bigger, but the Fs of the particles, for cosmic rays at least, is not being affected by it. So in order to do that, you need to know a little bit of uh, you know, what is happening. So have a physical intuition of what is happening. But your comment is absolutely appropriate. So there are situations in which the quasi-linear theory, I'm sorry, the, the linear perturbations, the perturbative theory, is giving you a hint that something dramatic is going to happen. And at that point, you know that you, are, you need some other approach. We have always the minimum number of three questions before coffee, so keep find another two. Just go and <laughs> look in uh, some hidden place for questions. If I understand well, you mentioned that in a plasma we don't have electric field, but large scale electric field. Uh, yeah, but it shouldn't be huge the electric field next to each charge. That's why I said large scale. So the small scales uh, which are associated with the individual particles, those are fine. Those are the fields which modify the dynamics on, on small scales of the plasma. But those are the ones that we are averaging out. All right. Those are large, but they are on short, small scales. We're interested in what happens on large scales, large space scales, large time scales, and so on. So that's the purpose of averaging that we made. understand that this d by scale, Pasquale was mentioning, is really microscopic compared to the astrophysical ones. Yeah. So, you know, you don't want to describe a, a star looking at a no. centimeter. Or... Maybe, well, I get to the other question. If you could define the actual size of the small and the large, like quantitatively. Yeah, that will require going at least, I mean, I can give you the formula, but it doesn't do any justice because it's, it doesn't teach you anything. So maybe what we can do is derive maybe this afternoon the, 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 the by length. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. There in that equation, you said that the perturbation term was of order n. Not the perturbation term. This also is a perturbation term. OK. But I'm saying, that... yeah, the interaction between terms. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you discard it. Mm. But if we apply the same criterion, we can say that the first term is of order n also. The first term. The, the derivative with, the, with respect to time. Sure, sure. But this is just the time derivative of the distribution function. It's uh -huh. not, you know, that, that's the, you can say that this is <laughs> zero. I, I but, yes, I understand what is. No, okay. we are only comparing the, the two terms that come from the perturbation. That's all, you know, the, okay. from the perturbative theory. So the time derivative of the distribution function has two terms. One is zero order, and it's the uh, electromagnetic force. Second term is the interaction between particles and fields, perturbed particles, perturbed fields, and that's a small number. Now, even here, I mean, one should be very careful. Uh, when, I, when we do these simple exercises, we always put ourselves in the most ideal situation. I just give you an instance of a situation in which this is not fulfilled. This is wrong. Um, close to a shock wave. Uh, we discussed many times yesterday supernova remnants, uh, gamma ray bursts, and um, uh, at some point the word shock wave was thrown into the game. <laughs> uh, Shockwave forms because you have supersonic and uh, superalvanic motion of a plasma. Okay, that's the conditions that you have. 
And we will see tomorrow that at a shock wave, you have efficient dissipation. So you start from a plasma, which is adiabatic, and you end up in this very narrow layer that you call a shock front with strong dissipation. Now, of course, if I neglect this term, there is no way that I can have any dissipation because this is Liouville theorem. This is saying that uh, everything is, the number density is conserved in phase space. And I want dissipation. And this is the guy that is doing it. And the reason being that inside the shock wave, these terms are not small at all. So actually, this is becoming dominant compared with this term. And that's why I have dissipation. So all what we said, uh, using Vlasov equation and so on, is wherever you are far away from wild fluctuations. A shock front is not a place where to apply shock waves, but uh, Vlasov equation. But if you're sitting on the right, and if you're sitting on the left of the shock wave, where the plasma is roughly adiabatic and so on, then this is a good approximation. And you will see tomorrow that the shock wave appears as a boundary condition in the problem. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you can join the two solutions and you find out that you are forced to have a shock front there, but it's not described by this. So that, uh, you re resume that unknown information in the boundary mm -hmm. conditions? In that yes. case, yes, in the okay. case of the shock front. So, sure. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, so the few that actually accelerates the cosmic rays are those small scales electric fields or not? Well, yeah, in the same way that the particle velocity in a gas like, um, you know, in, in any gas can change continuously. But on average, even if you take a plasma which is thermal, no? Locally, the particle energy can be much larger or much smaller than the thermal energy, no? because there are forces acting on, on the particles. But again, once you average on these small scales, all these effects go away. But it is true. I mean, the particle energy changes continuously during the evolution. This is absolutely so. Actually, this is a good question. So for instance, going back to the issue that we've said before, the shock example, no? We will go back to that tomorrow. But it's interesting that the particles are never interacting with each other in these systems. In other words, the term that Pasquale Serpico wrote, to, uh, wrote yesterday, one over n sigma, not six, one over n sigma, is always gigantic compared with all the scales in the system. Completely negligible, okay? And yet, because of the interaction of the electric magnetic fields and the fluctuations on F, the particle distribution re-thermalizes to a new temperature behind the shock. So the gas is heated, it's, the energy is dissipated. So you can have dissipation, heating in a plasma, without ever having two particles interacting with each other directly. Your two particle collisions are completely negligible here. It's only the interaction of these fluctuating fields generated by all the others, what we call collective effects, that lead to dissipation. And I think this is a very good point to stop and thank Pasquale again. Okay, thank you. But please keep all the questions for the discussion session. Okay, Bill. so now we go for coffee break. And right before the coffee break, toward the end, come and see me for the slides, okay? Even those of you that send them to the secretary, please rename them, as I said yesterday, have them on a, on a USB stick, and come to me, please, okay?